Now, manifestations of fascist ideology infiltrate democratic nations and illiberal democracies have gained a solid foothold in some parts of Europe. Jason Stanley is the author of How Fascism Works, and he examines Putin's brand of that ideology in his latest piece for Tablet magazine. He joins Hari Srinivasan to explore this version of fascism and how it targets the West's vulnerabilities. This interview is part of Exploring Hate, which is our ongoing series on anti-Semitism, racism, and extremism. Christian, thanks. Jason Stanley, welcome back to this program. Uh, you have written an authoritative book on fascism. I, I want to look a little bit at the type of fascism that maybe is playing out in front of our eyes in the case of Russia's invasion of Ukraine and how that's different from the definitions that we might have seen in our textbooks. So Russian fascism, uh, and I think it's just uh, an almost unmistakable uh, species of fascism. It is a classic kind of fascism in its colonial aspect. So fascism is typically uh, uh, linked to empire, the desire to restore empire. We find fascist fascism, fascist leaders gaining popularity when they can talk about lost empire and tell their citizens that uh, that they're going to be the leader who's going to violently restore their empire and their place in the world. So in that sense, it's a classic kind of fascism. And it's and in its violence and militarism, it's a classic kind of fascism. And in the way that it appeals to, uh, to anti-LGBT sentiment and a number of other ways, it's classic fascism. But, uh, but Russia seeks to... Uh, as it worked, because it cannot dominate the world militarily anymore, or economically. It's really not a superpower like China or the United States. It's really seeking to dominate the world ideologically. And what does that mean here? What it means is uh, Putin seeks to be the leader of the world's traditionalists, the ethno-nationalists, uh, the patriarchal, uh, uh, anti-democratic um, in the United States, white supremacists, he seeks to say, I am going to defend traditional values against decadence and weakness. Uh, and so in this way, he's going to gather all the different ethno-nationalist movements to him. And also, he's going to gather traditionalist members of minority groups uh, who might not be uh, led led to follow a kind of strict ethnic nationalism. One of the rationales that Vladimir Putin explicitly gave anyway, was that he wanted to denazify Ukraine and almost indemnify himself from this idea that he was perpetrating uh, an aggressive act. This is classic fascism. Um, classic fascism uh, involves calling what your enemy, uh, calling your enemy uh, what you yourself are, uh, what you yourself are. So, mm -hmm. uh, so Putin is clearly doing this in Ukraine. By denazification, uh, Putin means that he's going to uh, go into Ukraine. Uh, he's going to take the democratic ideology that Ukraine uh, has embraced since the Maidan revolution of 2014. Uh, he's going to remove it from institutions uh, and schools and politics. He's going to place the leaders on trial and show trials, uh, reminiscent of Nuremberg, uh, execute or imprison them, and replace them with Russian ideal with Russian fascist ideologues, and extinguish completely Ukrainian democratic identity and Ukrainian identity. Full stop. So, what can the democracies that are standing around the planet do in the face of this? in the absence of a military intervention. We obviously have put in economic sanctions that, that are slower working than many people would like, but how does ideologically democracy stand up in the face of this? So recall uh, from our, the beginning of our discussion that Putin's, Putin's version of fascism is not specifically about Russian eth eth ethnic, eth ethnic Russians dominating the world, as German fascism was. German fascism was about Aryans dominating the world. It's about 
traditionalist ethno-nationalists uh, dominating each of their countries with a, a strong, powerful, masculine leader. So uh, it could be a woman, I suppose, as we see uh, in France's elections, uh, but it's about a kind of, it, it, it's, it's, it's about protecting uh, supposedly traditional values against, democ against democracy, uh, decadence, uh, et cetera. Um, so what democracies must do uh, is that, that they, they must show that they're not corrupt, decadent, and weak. Uh, that's what Putin believes. Uh, that's what Putin fosters. Uh, and I don't want to say Putin is the singular agent here. Uh, the United States has long had anti-democratic forces of this sort uh, that Putin uh, allies with. Um, but democracies have to show that they are strong. Uh, and democracies can show they are strong. Ukraine is showing that it is strong. Uh, I, I remember my, my grandmother in her book, uh, uh, The Unforgotten, a 1958 book, talks about how she's with my father in New York City. They had just come from Berlin, Hitler's Germany. And my father is looking at these soldiers marching down Broadway. It's 1941, chewing gum and slapping each other's backs. And my father says, they're never going to beat the Nazis because he had seen the Nazi army uh, march down the Kufersendam in Berlin in strict order. Uh, and my grandmother said, no, that's exactly why they will beat the Nazis. And that's what Ukraine is showing right now. Ukraine is showing that democracies have strength and democracies have value. Democracies have strength uh, when they stand up for their values, uh, when they prove accountability. Um, and what Putin thinks, uh, you know, rightfully so, is that democracies have proven themselves to be hypocritical and weak. Look, our democracies have always been partial. Um, so the best thing we can do is we can show that our democracies uh, stand up for the values uh, that that they represent, freedom and equality. Do you think that the events in the past few years in the United States has weakened the well brand of democracy that we've been exporting around the world? And does Putin pick up on that and say, look at this, you can meddle within an election, you can cause, uh, you know, internal strife, but then you can even have people attack its own capital and frankly, uh, you know, not be held accountable. That's exactly right. I don't like the language of exporting because, frankly, when we tried to export democracy, it's typically been at the barrel of a gun, and mm -hmm. that is not how you export a democracy. You, ac you, you export democracy by standing up for its values at home, and we failed to do that. Uh, from, uh, from our own, we failed to, uh, in accountability for our own imperial wars of aggression, uh, like the Iraq War, uh, we failed with accountability for the financial crisis, and we failed uh, uh, most recently with accountability for the attack on our own democracy. So uh, obviously, uh, Putin is is right uh, to to think that democracies are weak and don't stand up for their values. Uh, if we can't hold accountable the figures who led us into wars that caused terrible devastations. Uh, if we can't hold accountable uh, business leaders who destroyed our economy, and if we can't hold accountable a president who tried to steal the election and destroy American democracy, together with the numerous senators and congressmen who helped him, then in what sense are we a democracy? Uh, we're, we don't have the rule of law. And so uh, in what sense are, are, do we have free and fair elections? The threat to autocracies is free and fair elections. Uh, we're, you know, Putin can look at the United States and he can direct the world's gaze to the United States and show and, and say, see, look at what they're doing. Uh, they have non-existent uh, voter fraud, yet they're, uh, yet they're fighting it uh, with, uh, with a uh, electoral police, uh, with numerous uh, legislation essentially to, uh, to restrict voting and to potentially steal another election. Uh, so democracies do seem openly hypocritical and weak. Uh, and that is obviously, uh, th that is what um, Russia wants. Russia is not going to dominate the world. Russia is not a world power. Uh, but Russia can uh, help destroy democracy 
worldwide and therefore th thereby preserve its own autocratic regime at home. One of the chapters in your book um, deals with a sexual anxiety that is often used in fascism. And I wonder what you think when you look at the number of laws that are now uh, making their way through state legislatures, uh, either restricting women's control of their bodies or LGBTQIA rights um, in the United States. Right. So we should always remember, we citizens of a democracy, that the principal values of democracy are freedom and equality. And among the freedoms that citizens of a democracy enjoy are the freedoms uh, for uh, of the freedoms to identify how, how they want, to have the partners, uh, they, to have the adult partners they want. Uh, and this freedom is under attack. Uh, now, this kind of attack on LGBT citizens is very Eastern European in character. It comes in the wake uh, of an attack on so-called critical race theory, uh, on critical race theory, but the attack is really not on critical race theory. It's an attack on the teaching of our history, the teaching of our anti-democratic racist history. Uh, and now we have an attack on LGBT rights. And, and, uh, and, uh, and this is uh, extremely, this, is, this puts us into the worldwide autocratic context. If you look at uh, autocrats and would-be autocrats all over the world, uh, from Russia's uh, Russia's gay gay propaganda law in 2013 that prohibits uh, prohibits uh, teaching minors about uh, about uh, non-standard lifestyles um, uh, of non-traditional lifestyles uh, that was passed in 20, 2013 um, and had a terrible effect on uh, LG, the LGBT community in Russia. If we look at Viktor Orban's Hungary, uh, the recent election was dominated by attacks on LGBT. We look at Jair Bolsonaro uh, in Brazil, uh, and he, he won election uh, on, with attacks on LGBT. We see the American right now embrace, embracing this worldwide far-right autocratic attack on freedom. Uh, and so this is, this is just, Put, uh, putting us in line with the rest of uh, the fascist right worldwide. What is it about this that you think historically has stuck and even today makes it something that people can campaign on? In the United States, the base for, for this far right politics includes white nationalists. Um, but if you want to include some people who aren't white, go after a small minority like transgender Americans, a tiny group of Americans. Then you can gather a lot of people because you know everyone is like, I'm not that. And so maybe I can join the group and vilify them. So this group of traditionalists can then gather. And then even though this, you know, in the United States, the 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 audience here includes white nationalists who very prominently want to return to sort of a white a, 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 a state that prioritizes white uh, white Christianity, you're never they, they can have plausible deniability because they can say, look, um, we've got uh, black members of our movement who mm -hmm. also share with us this antipathy to LGBT. So it's about uh, it's about uh, gathering a larger coalition by ever greater vilification of a small minority while winking to the part of the coalition, uh, the large part of the coalition, that this is really helping. In the case of the United States, that would be sort of white Christianity. There was a piece in the New York Times recently, um, I think it's Elizabeth Diaz and Ruth Graham, uh, talking about how the growing religious fervor in the far right movement is, it is starting to include religious iconography, it is uh, including praise music, um, it's almost a little bit of a revival. Now, not everybody under the tent, so to speak, is coming for a church service, but it's certainly pulling in people who are uh, devout. So that's, that's because the global far-right fascist movement presents itself as the defender of traditional values. And this is not new. This is a textbook of fascist politics. If you look at Joseph Goebbels' speech, Communism with a Mask Off, in 1935, Goebbels says that, uh, that 
uh, Jewish Bolshevism is threatening uh, religious faith, cr Christianity, and that the only protection is national socialism. So what Putin is doing is he's reviving these themes. He's saying uh, liberalism uh, is a threat to tradition. Um, of course, liberalism is not a threat to tradition. Liberalism says that my uh, Orthodox Jewish cousins can live however they want, uh, and uh, and other people who aren't religious can also live however they want. But the idea here is to create this fear among traditional among people who choose to live traditionally that other people's choices threaten them, and in particular threaten their children. And then you say to them, "Look, they're going after your children. You need us to protect you." And then you say, "Look." You know, we can't play fair anymore. What democracy is, uh, and this goes back really to some of the oldest and worst tropes of the 20th century, like the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. What democracy is, is it's this method to, for pretend equality. It says everyone can live what they want, uh, how they want. But then really what it does is these, these liberties allow them to get at your children and corrupt your children. And mm. so you create such fear among traditionalists that they abandon democracy. As an example of that, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene tweeted the other day, uh, Democrats, I'm quoting, are the party of killing babies, grooming and transitioning children, and pro-pedophile politics. Uh, in a recent poll, 49% of Republicans said it was, quote, definitely or prob probably true that top Democrats were involved in elite child sex trafficking rings. QAnon conspiracies, um, these, are, these are going viral, and I'm wondering... This is not a small population of people in the United States that believe these things. Let's be very clear. QAnon, as all scholars who've written on it have, have said, uh, Talia Lavin, David Livingstone Smith, is connected clearly, is clearly descended from blood libel, the conspiracy theory against Jews that Jews were stealing Christian babies to, to, uh, for their religious rit rituals, and the protocols of the elders of Zion. Um, it's this. Uh, it's this conspiracy that there's a global cabal of elites, and the global cabal of elites is seeking uh, to, to conquer the institutions to get at your children uh, and, and control your children. Uh, and so it's not, there's no fairness anymore. It's just war. And you're not a man if you can't stand up to this because they're going after your women and children. It's that level of fear and paranoia that is seeped into, I don't even think seeped into is the right word anymore, uh, that has permeated much of American politics. And so it's a very extreme time when these sorts of old conspiracy theories uh, have infected the body politic. Jason Stanley, professor of philosophy at Yale, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much.